Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have the calibration plugins again. I finally did get a chance to talk to my customer and get some direction on where we wanted to go with these. Today we're going to tackle the PG506. If I can get it out. And we'll save the other two for a previous video or er, future video, not previous. So what we ultimately decided to do was do a light, because everything was working, do a light capacitor refresh as well as run it through an alignment because we're going to be in the unit. I have not actually done an A model yet, so this will be entertaining. A couple of big bulk filters down here that will need to be refreshed. Uh, I got a couple. Wow, this design is way different than the um, than the non A version. This is there's a lot. The non A version has a big relay board back here and a couple of other things that the A version is missing. I've got power caps here that need to be replaced. Big power cap here. Those are all pretty straightforward. Nothing too challenging there. This big power cap is going to need to be replaced, but nothing too challenging there. This one down here. Probably do... Might do that. These two electrolytics, but if that's the case, this board will need to come out. But if the board comes out, that will ultimately make the two that are hiding... I don't know if the camera can see it, but there are two that are hiding probably for the differential power rails back there. So, that's an odd, this board's at an odd angle. It's not flat, it's canted down to make room for some of the other boards. Here's the switch that allows the calibration. This is the square wave DC switch, so when you calibrate this unit you flip it up into DC and then you can run it through a DMM as opposed to needing a scope to do the alignment on it so yeah actually this is a real modern construction on one of these so yeah the gang switch is screwed into the board on the other side so so yeah what it looks like we'll have to do is I'll take a bunch of pictures uh, technicians photos and then what we'll do is we'll remove this top board. I don't see any inner connects. Um, might be. We may run into some challenges removing the top board. Yeah, it's got to come out that way because these, these screws are on the wrong side. So it does need to come off the top. There's another big filter can I need to unbury here, so yeah, it will need to come apart. There's a uh, board to board interconnect. I don't know if the camera's going to be able to pick this up, but way way down in here there's a board to board interconnect that we're going to have to deal with. Hopefully that's pinned and that'll come apart. And then I'm curious kind of how some of these switches are going to come apart. I am going to have to take some front panel knobs off. One of the drive transistors right here is literally heat synced to the chassis on this transistor right there. So, ugh, this one's going to be a mess to get into. The more I look at it, the more complicated this thing gets. It looks like it would be deceptively easy to pop this panel off to get to the cap that's sitting right here. The problem with that is uh, we have board screws here and here 
to actually get into this unit. Well, this was a pain in the butt to take apart. Holy cow. So, my immediate, my initial assessment was not correct, but we got it going. Uh, these pins are socketed, so they do pop off, and this board does pop off this way. The problem is you have the display, which is up here, and this one pin right here on the cam switch, it's really hard to make clearance for that. So what you have to do is you have to loosen all the front panel display boards, and it pulls forward just enough so you can disconnect these two connections, which will then allow you to clear this pin. And then, as we very gently, because we have cam switches on the bottom, So this cam switch rides with the board. This cam switch stays in the board. So you have to take the six screws off the top board here, leave these, these six screws here. These four screws come off the bottom and these four screws stay on the top. So. Here's the sockets that I were was really hoping were there. They are. Um, wow, that that was uh, <laughs> that was fiddly to take apart. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple of screws back in the front panel because I need to handle this board, move it around, do some stuff, and I don't want it just flopping around. This is the high speed trigger board and. I got hung up on that tantalum and that can. But this gives us good access. I can lubricate these cam switches. I can lubricate this cam switch. So we have some really good access to now service it. You have to be super careful when you're removing this board that you don't accordion those switches the wrong way. Because if you just yank it out this way and you don't have enough vertical clearance, these will all just fold up and that'll be it. It's, it the board's done unless you have a stock of switches that you can replace. Those aren't really fun to replace. Um, I had a, a TG501 that actually had a single busted one, and getting those to lay right is is a trick. So we have access to the caps I was hoping for. This guy, this guy, these two. So we have great access now. We did not need to unhook this transistor down here. So that's still nice and bolted in. And there's plenty of access on this particular board to get to everything, both the top and the bottom side. So we can actually start the capacitor replacement. Uh, that will also give me access, because I have this board out, that'll give me access for this cap, and this cap can also go. We'll do those up with 105 degree C caps and call it a day. One other thing to note of the front panel screws, this one right here, bottom, if you're looking at the front of the unit, bottom right is longer than the other three. So when you pop all the four screws out, you have one that's extra long. That goes in bottom right of the unit. Well, it seems this is going to be finicky. I have a uh, cap comes up here and oop, over here. Sorry about all the movement. However, focus, come on camera. The lead pops up right underneath this resistor and also get a pointer. Right underneath this diode is the other side of the capacitor. So and this diode is actually really critical. I'm pretty sure that diode is the Zener reference for the board. So hopefully they're more straightforward than that, but that one was kind of a pain in the butt to replace. All right, well, that was a royal pain in the butt. The, um, as far as capacitor replacements go, that's pretty straightforward. This unit is not. Um, large voltage bumps. In some of these capacitors, this was a 2 microfarad at a 150. It's now a 2.2 at 400. No reason for that other than that's what I had in stock. 
Uh, these were 50 volt caps. They're now 200 volt caps. So these are well above the voltage ratings and everything's 105 degrees C. So they should never have a problem again. This one's a little close to this power resistor. So is this one, but uh, we should be good there. Uh, da, 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 what else? Oh yeah, all the holes are blind. So I had to, I, it was it was a whole lot of test fitting. I had to do all the work on this side of the board. I couldn't even get to the other side of the board. Uh, this capacitor right here is buried by some diodes. Uh, same thing up here. This capacitor, this lead actually is buried in the resistor that's right, that's on the other side. Like the lead is dead center on the bottom of this resistor. So doing this service, uh, I had to do everything from this side of the board. And it was a royal pain in the butt. There is not a lot of room. I was checking for shorts, making sure I didn't get solder bridges or anything like that. So not the repair for the, um, this is not an easy upgrade be worth doing when it's done but uh of all the tech stuff i've done so far uh, on the channel and off the channel this has been the biggest pain in the butt in terms of getting access to things it is very tightly packed in here okay now we're done with the main recap of the board i have two more caps to go on this board very easy that one will not be a problem uh getting these two in and out was quite a trick working around these couple of inductors so you, you don't smoke the inductors out with soldering iron or scorch anything. Uh, this one wasn't too bad. I would not recommend going after one of these without the appropriate tools. So uh, I have a really nice uh, solder remover and um, some mid-quality mid irons and uh, especially with the uh, solder sucker, I would not do this if you were using one of the pump, uh, pump solder suckers. There's just not enough room uh, to get in on some of this stuff, and especially with all of the cat, all, all about 80% of the leads being buried underneath other components and things like that. There was a lot of time in this uh, test fitting and. Um, making sure lead length was right and nothing was going to short when it gets powered back up. So, yikes. All right. Well, I am ready to... Where are we at? So I'm going to lube up the uh, cam switches, make those turn a little bit nicer. And uh, then what we'll do is we'll replace those two uh, tiny caps on the upper board, get the upper board put back in, fire it up, make sure everything still works. Okay, here's our board with the capacitors replaced, and you'll notice there's no capacitors. Due to clearance issues, I had to mount the caps on the bottom side of the board, my maintaining polarity, of course, and uh, we should be able to get these to fit. So what I need to do now is lubricate the barrels, put everything back together, and we'll see if we broke it. Well, it turns out, as I was doing the final inspections on the unit before I powered it up, realized I missed one. So I had to swap on another cap real quick. And the camera will pick that up. There's that cap that's mounted on the bottom side of the board. It is plenty clearanced to the other board, so we should be good there. And I'll put the front face back on. And then we'll give this thing a, give this thing some power. All right, here we are, moment of truth. We have a pile of capacitors that have been replaced. Clean up the bench a little bit. I have the PG506 set to uh, 1 kilohertz frequency at about 0.2 millivolts per division. So we should, or I mean 5 millivolts, 5 millivolts square wave, not per division. Scope set to 100 millivolts per division, so I should get 5 divisions of display. And I want to make sure the channel is AC coupled. And we'll hit measure. Now, uh, one thing is I, I need to let this burn in for a while just to make sure none of the capacitors are going to have a problem. But also I need to leave this on for a while because the stability has been perturbed. Um, as this equipment ages, it gets a lot more stable. It doesn't move around that much. That's why some of the scopes I've made a comments in some of the videos saying 
this is the last calibration this will ever need is because they're so old, all the parts have finished drifting, everything's kind of really settled down. Unless the environment drastically changes or a part goes bad or something like that, everything should be stable for quite some time. Always good to check though. So we have it set to standard amplitude, fast rise is off, high amplitude's off, and that's all the way down. So no smoke. And we have square waves. And we're not triggering, that's for sure. There we go, now we're triggering. All right, and my peak to peak is 504 millivolts, so nice and stable. And we are good to go there. So I'm gonna let this thing cook for a while and then uh, make sure nothing burns down, watch it on the scope, make sure nothing's getting too hot, you know, general lab checks, things like that. So that's going to be several hours. Uh, actually, it's probably going to be more than several hours and maybe a couple of days. So lots, as this is a piece of calibration gear, stability is key. So we will then kick this over onto the 7510, do an alignment on it, because with the power supply being disturbed, the alignment that it came with is close because none of the pots changed, but it cannot be trusted anymore. All the PPMs have gone out the window. We are drawing about 20 watts out of the power supply, so nothing bad there. But all in all, I think this is good. Um, it looks like it may be done. So, hardest part now is just waiting and keeping the cat off the bench. Okay, I have been asked to show a bit more of the troubleshooting process. So, I have the unit set up for fast rise. I'm just checking its basic functions right now. Fast fall, that looks good. Uh, we'll do high amplitude, pop out the 50 ohm terminator. Come into the scope. Here we go, and we'll do high amplitude. Oh yeah, it's working. So, and we can change its frequency. Yes. All right, so everything is looking good. The frequency's not, let's see, yep, variable's working. So, all in all, unit's working just fine. We're gonna let it run. I'll set it to standard again. We'll just do that. And come here. There we go. So I'm gonna just let it burn in. I am using the Rigol to do this, not because the Rigol's inherently better than the tech scopes on the bench. It's because this is some long-term testing and I don't wanna burn the phosphor on the scopes when I don't have to. So that LCD screen on the Rigol isn't gonna care if it's on for several hours. With that display showing, the um, CRT-based scopes would. So it's just an anti-burn-in burn -in thing. So, I am not going to bore you guys with running this camera for the entire testing, so suffice it to say, the testing is happening, but uh, through the magic of the camera, what will take me multiple hours to maybe a day or two, will take you about half a second. Well, I was not expecting that. After running through the alignment procedure on this, warming up all the gear, uh, looking at it with the 7510, the 6500, my rubidium stabilized frequency reference, the Rigol, and the DS602A, nothing needed to be adjusted. It was checked. I ran it through the... Actually, I take that back. One thing needed to be adjusted, and it was nitpicky. The one thing that needed to be adjusted was the frequency of the standard waveform was off by two hertz on one kilohertz so by the spec sheet it would have passed and everything is good so i had two decimal places of zeros at 100 volts even the air voltage was uh spot on everything was in really good shape wherever this unit was before it came here and before it was owned by my customer it was very well taken care of uh, it was clean. Nothing really needed on here other than that cap refresh that was requested. Some highlights. Uh, obviously, the DC portion was spot on. All the ranges. that the, 
all the ranges had at least two decimal places of accuracy, and the unit is performing incredibly well. I'm going to move over to the uh, DSA 602, and we can take a look at what our edge speeds look like. All right, we'll zoom in here on the DSA. Pardon the uh, screen scrolling. That's just the refresh rate of the camera and the refresh rate of the scope getting irritated at each other. Uh, looking at our rise time, we can do a measurement, and we are at 952 picoseconds of rise time. The rise time spec on a PG506 is one nanosecond, so meets spec. Aberrations look good. This is a very healthy pulse. The 11A72 is a 1 gigahertz plug-in, so we're pushing this plug-in with a 1 nanosecond rise time to its limits, but it's suitable for this particular measurement. We're going to kick over here real fast to the fast fall. And, of course, that's going to be way out of screen, so what we're going to do is... Turn that back on. Waveform, or no, sorry, trigger. We're going to trigger on the negative going slope. And we're going to move this down. Going to move our trigger up. And now we have a fast falling edge. And then let's measure the fall time. It's going to freak out. Oh, yeah, fall time is 833 picoseconds, so even a little bit quicker. So also the aberrations on this look good. Everything looks to be in great shape. Um, the astute may notice the scales a little light. I do not have the pulse amplitude turned all the way up, uh, but we can for good measure. We'll just drop this down. And crank this all the way up. And we'll move the waveform down again. Too much. Nope, even with fine adjustment, I cannot extend it anymore. So there we go. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at the PG506A. This particular unit is not mine. I wish it was, but it's going to go back to its owner, ready to spread some PPMs and align some scopes in their lab. If you like what you're seeing in the videos, hit the subscribe button. Possibly also check out the Patreon channel. Patreon has, is three videos ahead, and they have some other releases there as well. The Dish of Shame... We have some bad caps this time, no surprise for a piece of equipment this age, but this one was in great condition. I have two more to do before the uh, scope cal set is finished, SG505 and a, T and a TG501. Those will be additional videos. If you are curious about what it takes to align one of these uh, plugins, take a look at the description below. I'll leave a link to the video. I have a PG506 video that goes into detail on how to do one of the alignments. So that is already up on YouTube, has been for a while. As with everything else, I will see everybody in the comments section in between videos. And more is always on the way.